Good morning, afternoon, evening or night, whenever you're watching this, welcome. It's a beautiful autumn day and I'm visiting the North Yorkshire coastal village of Robin Hood's Bay and the bay from which the village takes its name. Here be fossils and history, perhaps some relics, and of course it is always nice just getting away to the seaside. Let's see what I can find. <laughs> is heading out and the fossil hunters are moving in. The cliffs in the centre point of the bay are mostly boulder clay, but further out away from the village there are several distinct layers in the cliffs and the beach, from stages of the lower Jurassic through to the Cretaceous epoch. The fossils hereabouts are mostly from shallow water marine environments, which means lots of bivalves, marine plants and coral fossils, some land animal footprints, ammonites and belemnites, occasionally even fish. I did once find a most beautiful fossilised fish here. Unfortunately I was nine years old, had no fossil extracting tools and it was part of a rock the size of a family car. Today I'll be happy if I find anything interesting really. These bivalve fossils are quite interesting, so I'm already happy. Interesting, but not all that exciting, so probably won't take many. I've started amongst these sea defence rocks on the basis that I suspect few people ever really look here. When I've satisfied myself that there isn't anything really other than bivalve fossils here, I shall move on to the ground beneath the cliff, the dangerous, unstable and often crumbling cliff. Then I shall head back to the village where there's a stream and a tunnel that apparently was well used by smugglers, see if I can find anything interesting in there. There are certainly parts of the cliffs here that I would not want to get this close to, but here I think the sea defence stones were successful in keeping the cliff from getting destabilised. It really does look quite benign. Fossil scallop shell maybe? A fairly nice imprint fossil, but mudstone so it's about as good as it's going to get, and it's quite matte, flat, grey. It's also a place where a fossil hunter has been breaking open rocks, so unlikely to find anything particularly good here. Onwards. Tons of fragments of simple bivalve shell shapes. Now there's a tongue twister. And I really wasn't expecting to find brass, but I have. Part of a small pulley system. I wonder if it came from something like a grandfather clock. And somewhere, if I can find it again, there's part of an old engine block. Which makes me think that maybe there was an old dump site on land up at the top of a cliff, but has eroded away. I think that's possibly a pinner shell about 20 centimetres. I've spotted it for a bit of an old engine. It's very muddy and very rusty, and I'm not quite sure what type of engine this amorphous mass used to be part of. Is that a piece of clay pipe? It is, and that really convinces me that there's an old dump site, maybe just a far midden dump, but a dump site nonetheless, falling off the cliff. These mudstone flats are probably where I'm supposed to be looking for footprints of ancient animals, but I think I'd need a guide to point them out to me, the shapes are all softened and vague. Looked like something but just mud.
Massive flaky mudstone boulders. Lots of fossilised things. Not sure though whether they're shells of razor clam like creatures or plant material. That bunch looks more like shells, I think. Hmm, interesting. A clump of fragments of shells and what looks like maybe a hint of rib cage along the top. Might it have been the last dinner of a shark, maybe? Only really quite old sharks have dense enough to fossilise skeletal cartilage. They infuse calcium salts into their cartilage as they age. It's a complete shot in the dark, much more likely it was just a small dent in the mud where the tide once collected some shell fragments. And over here, pits where nodules possibly containing ammonite fossils were. Most of them will have been collected already by fossil hunters. The pinna shell, I think that's how it's pronounced. Fair sized example, but they can get to 90 centimetres long, and varieties of pinna still live in the oceans today. Do any fossil experts watching, or geologists perhaps, know what these strange lumpy things are? The fossils of coral, maybe? I'm pretty sure the green bits of them are algae growing on the surface, but it's not really growing on the grey mudstone, so there's something in the redstone that the algae really likes. Limpets and barnacles seem to really like it too. like this on the beach, little geode-like structures with veins of either quartz or marble maybe. I think this is the only one I've seen though that's still in the host rock, they're mostly separate rounded stones. Not sure how they formed, whether there was perhaps a hapless creature whose shell provided the calcium carbonate material to form marble, or if it's just a mineralised nodule. If you know then please do tell. This is the reason I think maybe the nodule veins are marble or something like. The fossils here look remarkably like the same material, even the matrix rock layer they're in is similar. And then again we've got stones that just look like quartz as formed in more or less the usual way. Superheated, supersaturated mineralised water seeping through cracks in rocks that are under great pressure and strain. A fossil of something. I'm not sure what, maybe a crab. Don't know if this is something I could reveal with careful application of Dremel grinding bits, but I might give it a try. Thought it looked like an ammonite, but on a closer look, don't think so. Kinda sad that plain bivalve fossils aren't really collected by fossil hunters, they've been waiting so long in a protective cocoon of rock and now just getting slowly worn away. 
quite beautiful these huge shell bed boulders with six inch thick layers of fossilized shells and this is possibly the most fun piece of plastic i found today a pirate's sword now where is the plastic x that marks the spot to dig not quite an x but it is kind of beautiful like a fossilized bolt of lightning Maybe a crinoid, maybe a worm. These look to be wormholes. I'm sure there's a more specific name for them, but I don't know it. Oh, before I go further, I should warn anyone that fancies coming here, please check the tides beforehand. I arrived at the beach two hours before low tide. When it's heading towards high tide, where I've just passed, the sea races in there and often cuts people off, necessitating a coast guard call out. If you see anything interesting then, please do shout out. Looks like a fossilized tube worm, and so very many shell fossils, which I guess aren't as appealing to collectors because they're very common, they're pretty much the same as modern day non-fossilized shells, only not as colourful and somewhat encased in big rocks. It did cross my mind that some of these layers on larger slabs could possibly be polished up or set in resin and used in bespoke tabletops. Maybe they already are but they'd have to be floated out of here, and that would be far beyond my kit to try. Lots of belemnites in this piece, or rather the hard portion of their internal skeletons. They were cephalopods, a bit like squid, left behind little stone bullets. Fossilised in mudstone, very delicate, and I'd destroy these if I tried to remove them. This little patch of gravel is in part made up of former mudstone fossils. Nothing is permanent. Live cockles and snails, winkles and barnacles, they all seem to like the layer of shell bed. I'm wondering if they're mining it for the minerals to build their own shells. Or if it's just that the shell beds provide a modicum of shelter and an easy thing to grip onto. Ooh, this is different. Lots of tubular things. Could be worms, could be corals, could be seaweed, probably not bones. I don't know. What I do know is that this is far more varied than the single type of fossil I find in the rivers back home. That's not to say that there aren't fossils other than Lepidodendron stigmaria in the rocks where I live. There was, in the 18th century, a nice piece of black limestone that a local stream was cutting through. It had nautilus shells and fish fossils, and is still there under the hill, under woodland and fields. But the stream cut right through it and is going through a bit of a carboniferous phase right now. Lepidodendron stigmaria and vague rotting plant debris fossils is what I can find in West Yorkshire rivers, so it's always wonderful to come here, regardless of whether I come away with anything. That one looks much more like a definite fossil than most, but the tendril that seems to be branching off it looks like a crack in the rock. So maybe some of the nodules were quartz crystals that got caught in sandstone and melted under high pressure and expanded out through weak points. I should book myself on a geology tour here sometime, there's a lot I'd like to learn. Just checking how far I've got to walk back, I think I can go a bit further. I want to take. Two ammonites, side on and cut in half. Unusual cluster of shapes, I have no idea what they might have been. Alas, the wind has picked up considerably, and I kind of want to get out of the sun and have a drink of water before I get a migraine. My bag, and importantly my water bottle, is a quarter mile back along the beach with my girlfriend, so let's start heading back. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
this is pretty much a perfect nodule shape, the kind that fossil hunters on YouTube crack open to reveal magnificent Hildocera salmonites. Can't see anything along the edge, and this bottom bit does look like it's got some different minerals, but there's nothing clearly indicating a wonderful extinct mollusk shell shape inside. If I had a hammer big enough, I'd certainly try to crack this open. Think I'd need a sledgehammer and some chisels, and the hammer I have in my bag isn't going to be enough. Oh well, for anyone watching who lives local enough and thinks it's worth a try, it's right here. There's a blue rope visible on that hillside there, and it's pretty much in line with this. Of course, the tide will come in and move things around quite a few times before I get this video out, so probably not worth trying. be fossils that the sentient life forms of the time who collect things largely ignore. That's a pretty yellow one. I have been picking up a few shells here and there today. This is the brightest one, but not quite the prettiest to my eyes. The sea defence wall was considered a necessity after the sea took 20 buildings from the village. It was finished in 1974 and is about to be largely rebuilt. Currently protects about 40 buildings from being taken by the sea. Now who's ready for a tunnel once supposedly used by smugglers? Too many people around to do a wider shot, but here's the entrance to the tunnel through which flows the King's Brook and the arch looks really quite new, as well as some of the cement work. I think that that's an extension to the original tunnel, which I couldn't find a date for. Maybe I'll find some clues inside. Right, gotta stop and try to get my head torch to behave properly. Okay, regardless of whether my head torch is behaving, my camera is going to struggle. It always does in half light, so I'll bring you back when I'm a bit further into more solid dark. First relic find, a piece of iron, and looks like maybe part of a boat rudder. Probably not that interesting, but might try extricating it on my way out and see if it's something interesting. Oh, lots of footprints in the mud. That's not something I usually find in tunnels I explore. Just there to my left there's an opening, and I think that's the outflow for a very small waterway called Manardale Beck. I will take a look up there on the way back, but King's Brook first, a little trickle with history. The King's Brook, a name dating from the dissolution of the monastery at Whitby that used to own this land, and the land and the brook became the property of King Henry VIII. Well, that's not the most reassuring sight, a stone which should be firmly set in the roof, hanging down loosely. Back to the history. 
This village is famous for rampant endemic smuggling that happened here during the 1700s and this tunnel is known to have been sometimes used by smugglers. But though it comes out where the village meets the beach, it was probably only a small part of the network. For the most part it flows to the south of the village and doesn't go anywhere near the top end of the village from where the smuggled luxury goods, avoiding high customs charges that were levied to pay for costly wars in Europe, would be carried off across the moors towards Pickering and York. Most of the contraband was carried underneath the houses through tunnels and connected cellars, easily avoiding any potential government eyes on the streets. Almost at the daylight, and sadly that means my camera will go all grainy for a bit again, so I'll edit that out. Out of the tunnel for the time being, and I'm planning on heading up as far as the bridge. This is a sewer line heading down towards the sea, and from what I've read, I looked this up before I came today because of a quite graphic review on TripAdvisor, it is now largely rerouted to a treatment plant in Whitby, six miles north of here, but if there is a blockage or a pump failure, or too much rainfall for the pipe to deal with, then in order to prevent the pipe from backing up into people's houses and gardens, it's vented into this brook and the sea. There was a sewage discharge warning in Robin Hood's Bay two months ago, so if you want to swim from pretty much any of the beaches in the UK, indeed in most of the world really, it's really advisable to check for water quality test results online first if they're available. Today the water quality rating for here is clean and swim safe on both the Environment Agency and Surface Against Sewage websites. Not the nicest subject, but if I should warn people about the risks of going too close to the cliffs or getting cut off by the tides, then I should probably warn people too about other potential dangers. Did I warn people about the cliffs here? Please do not go very near them. I saw two rock falls this afternoon and heard a further three. One of the times I was about five metres from the cliff and rocks fell just behind me, came to a stop within two metres of where I was. I moved rapidly away. And suddenly we're almost at the bridge, which allows the main single carriage road to go down to the beach. I haven't found anything much of interest in the brook, although when we get back to the tunnel I'm going to conduct a more thorough search. I think there may well be coins and other relics stuck between cobblestones. Okay, it's in a straight line with the road, flows under the centre of the road, that's actually fairly unusual for drainage, so is it a natural stream beneath the road? If it's not for road drainage, then there should be pipes alongside the bridge that drain into the brook. No, no drainage pipe outflows, but drainage holes in the bridge's roadside walls. So I guess that that little tunnel houses a natural spring-fed stream coming up beneath the centre of the road. I guess that wasn't necessarily a problem when the street was compacted soil or cobbles, before being radically altered for the convenience of automobiles. We have light that's attracting moths, and a short section of cobblestones in a tunnel. And cobblestones catch coins between them, so let's see. There's one alongside that brass bolt, and the coin could be silver. It's going to take some digging out, and I did not bring chisels to the seaside, I wasn't expecting this. It's really hard to keep the camera steady while digging for coins, so I don't know how much of the footage of it I'll include. I've been digging to get this one out for more than three minutes now, only spoke when I knew I was getting close. It's a modern twopence piece. I think there's going to be some brutal editing needed. The next coin out is hiding somewhere in this clouded up water. Oh joy, it's a modern penny. But such is life for most metal detectorists, and lots of modern finds and very few very old ones. I haven't attempted the possibly silver one yet. I've just found another possibly silver coin right next to a copper coin, which I'm pretty sure is a modern penny. Going to take some digging out. And by the magic of editing, the digging is done. I liberated a modern penny, a possibly centuries old copper square nail, and this, which is indeed partially silver, 
50%. It is a quite rust-stained 1933 silver sixpence. The six is under the rust. I could only see the X of the six. Pence is more or less readable, as is the date. And on the back, poor King George V is not really visible at all. I shall try to do something about that when I get home. Now on to the next. This one is not going to come out today, not without damaging it. A third possibly silver coin, and it's not as firmly stuck as that last one. That's loose enough now for fingers, I think. Let's see what it is. Yes, that's another silver sixpence. Different design on this side, so different year. It's 1939, first year of the Second World War, and a different king from the other sixpence. This one should be George VI, younger brother of Edward VIII, who was king for less than a year, abdicated so he could marry the American socialite Wallace Simpson, something that the church he was head of as king would not, and at the time could not, allow. This one was tough to get out, took every tool, and it's crusted and obscured, and I have no idea what coin it is. Well, some idea. I suspect it's a modern penny, but I can't tell. And I also extracted this, which looks to me like a coat hook. How one of those would end up in the stream, I have no idea. It is a relatively small section of cobblestones, going from about 5 metres above the tunnel, strangely no finds there, to 7 metres into the tunnel, where there were quite a few finds. And then they're covered over with concrete. I bet there's loads of coins trapped beneath. But if there are potholes in the concrete and it breaks up a bit in the middle section, there'll be more relics to find. Can't even see the bottom of that one. I think my digging activities may have clouded the water a bit too much. Oh well, there's plenty more tunnel for it to settle out in. This one's clearer, and yeah, I can see a few bits of copper. Some humble copper wire, I'm always happy to find it. Some more wire, but too stuck, and my girlfriend is waiting patiently down the other end of the tunnel, in a pub beer garden with a drink and chips, but don't want to spend too long on just wire. There's a coin here. Got it. And this is a modern five pence piece with the outer nickel coating worn off. Anything else? There's something that I think is probably wire. Looked a bit like a copper square nail, but even if it is, I should move on. Monardale Beck looking almost dry. Looking much less dry here, I'm not going to go further. This is one of the tunnels that is suspected to have been used by smugglers. A beautiful wooden roof to it, which may have once had trapdoors, into cellars beneath houses further on, but overhead here, if my underground overground wobbling senses of direction and distance are correct, I think I'm probably under the public conveniences. Almost back to daylight and the concrete has ended, or broken up, hard to tell. It's possible even that the sea might have pushed some of these rocks this far into the tunnel. The door handle, I think it's iron, certainly quite heavy, so brass would be a potential possibility if it wasn't for the fact that none of the copper or copper alloys here have been particularly oxidised, so iron, pretty sure. Now that's definitely brass, with a little bit of lead on one end. And that's brass. Huh. 
Mm. I think it's part of a door mechanism. Not a lock, just the bit that goes into the door frame to keep the door closed and is pulled out by turning the door handle. Another bit of brass. Long, thin, squared. No idea. Some interesting looking ironwork there, but there's no chance I'm going to be able to get that out. So I'll concentrate my efforts on easier targets. There's a coin there. Two pence piece, but by far the easiest coin of the day to extract. Looks to be a couple square nails still in there, but my girlfriend is at the mouth of a tunnel now, so I must go and talk and maybe come back for it. Oh, wow, well, yes, I'll be coming back. There's two, three, maybe four coins and a button in that little pool alone. Roundup time. I did go back into the tunnel for the coins, found quite a few, but they were all modern and not really worth filming. Then my girlfriend and I had a nice walk on the beach. She went for a swim and I mooched around looking for more fossils. Did find what might have been a very degraded whale bone firmly stuck in a cliff face. And then we stood still on the beach as bats flew all around us, hunting. It was a wonderful experience but not enough light for my camera to film it for you, though I did try. All in all, that was a very good trip. I don't think anything in it was exceptional. The restaurant food was just all right. One takeaway meal was actually quite bad. The drive there and back was uneventful. The fossils weren't what most fossil collectors would class as spectacular. The coins in the brook were all less than a hundred years old. Can anything from that hunt really be counted as treasures? Well, yes for memories. To get it out of the way first, I hope I'll remember to set up my camera better in the future than I did on that trip, because editing this video was painful seeing how bad some of the footage was. Now the nice memories. I'll remember the nice fossil hunters that we got chatting to, who taught me things and were okay with being in the background of my video, except that I didn't end up filming them. I'll remember later that evening we went to Whitby Abbey, six miles up the coast, the first place that Dracula ran to for refuge after his ship, the Demeter, ran aground nearby. I tried out the night lapse function on my camera there, not for very long, only about 15 minutes, which resulted in about 3 seconds of footage, here. And we walked around the graveyard by moonlight. I'll remember finding silver coins for the first time on camera. Precious metals really aren't as precious to me as history and learning things and stories. But though the reality of it is not particularly exciting, thinking of it in terms like finding silver in smuggler tunnels is full-on adventure story material. Related to the silver coins, I'll remember the surprise I felt at finding so many coins in the tunnel, as if all of the footprints in the mud in there were left by people who didn't look down and didn't see that there were things to find, and did so in the wider setting of a place where people come from hundreds of miles around specifically to look down and find things. Could I really be the first in a hundred years or so to look for relics in the famous smuggler's tunnel? I'll remember how much I enjoyed being there with my girlfriend, who couldn't go hopping over the rocks hunting fossils or scraping around for relics in tunnels, but who truly loves being beside and swimming in the sea. 
and remembering all of that makes me really want to go back to see the sea again, soonish, perhaps after a winter storm, when the fossil places will have freshly fallen fossils to find. I do want to go to other places too, a tour around the whole coastline of Britain and some of the islands is a recurring fantasy, but is a long ways away from my economic reality, so isolated visits will happen and maybe a few mini tours of small sections of the coastline might happen. So who thinks that I should advertise where I'm going to be in my not very often visits to anywhere outside of West Yorkshire? Any mudlarkers and beachcombers who might like to meet up for a lark, or any recommendations for places that I might find interesting and find interesting things? Or just any place that you really fancy me making a video, and, and I'm sorry before anyone says for Thames, the Port of London Authority has recently suspended new mudlarking permits for an indefinite amount of time, which I suspect might be a year or more. They do intend to start again, but only when they've got more data and plans in place for how to tackle the migration of unrecorded important London history from the foreshore into private collections and eBay sales. That's as much as I know, which isn't much. And it's a tangent, so back to Robin Hood's Bay, or the things that I found there. We'll do it in sections, for Fossil Beach, for Tunnel, and other. It was intended to be a fossil hunting visit, and it wasn't great. Oh, there were hundreds, thousands of easily viewable fossils, but not many that were really both interesting and portable. Having said that, I do really like this one. I've never found side-on fossil outlines like this before, and I'm kind of surprised that I recognised it so easily. The shapes, devoid of context and scale, are redolent of other things, like zooplankton, and the bigger one in particular, which has a broken shell, currently at the bottom end, looks remarkably like a bacteriophage. They also look kind of like a scientific drawing, and maybe that's really why I like this fossil. I've always liked diagrams and cross-sectional drawings. I also brought home a fossil of a coral, I think, a ball of short tendrils. A few more tendril-like things on this, but better defined and could be seagrass. A section of another coral, I think, it's hard to be sure. And the mystery fossils still hidden in stone, which I haven't yet developed the confidence to try revealing. I have read up a bit on how it's done, watched a few videos, not quite ready yet to give it a go. Both the brass pulley wheel and the piece of clay pipe stem were unexpected, but not really surprising finds. Same with a large portion of an old rusty engine that the pipe stem was stuck to. Dump sites are many places. Anywhere with an old settlement will have one close by. Sometimes it'll be buried under a new housing development, and sometimes under a field that used to be 30 metres from the cliff edge and is now falling off. Some shells. I really like the geometric patterns on them. No idea why I take shells when I visit beaches. I know I could sell them for crafts on Etsy, but I don't intend to. A pirate sword. Sadly didn't find any pirates or a treasure hoard. Did find more plastic, of course, but that's likely already been recycled, for bits that can be, and for rest, buried in a landfill, I guess. That was the fossil hunt. The tunnel wasn't intended to be a mudlarking hunt in the cracks between cobblestones. It was a very impromptu search, tagged onto a bit of exploration, because I saw cobblestones in a stream and I've learned to associate them with metal relics. Considering that it was very time limited, I told my girlfriend before leaving her alone in a pub's outside seating space that I was going to be 15 minutes, 25 tops. So I didn't go after everything I saw, left at least one potentially silver coin in there. I still found a lot. 19 coins in total, of which 13 are modern and still spendable, 3 of which I couldn't get out without damaging, so left behind, and 3 that are a little older. A halfpenny from the reign of Queen Elizabeth II, date worn off, but dating from a relatively small time window between 1971 and 1984. A silver sixpence from 1933 in the reign of King George V, another from 1939 when George VI was king. It is always really nice to find something that you haven't found before, and silver sixpences was one of them. 
There will never be that same level of excitement in me at finding one again, but don't think that finding them will ever become blasé. Not like the currently spendable one and two pence coins, which are sort of frustrating to find and spend minutes carefully extracting in the hopes that they'll turn out to be something more interesting. I found a few copper square nails and a copper rivet, some copper wire, always welcome. I learned from a helpful commenter on a previous video that this black covering to the ironwork of this door handle is probably ferrous sulphide, which forms in oxygen poor high sulphur environments, which suggests a lot of pollution in that poor little stream for decades. Such pollution is now, thankfully, a rarer occurrence. Low oxygen meant that the brass and copper things were really easy to spot. Copper oxide is brownish, but brass is yellow and copper is copper-coloured. So how I mistook this square long piece of copper for brass, I don't know. It being copper means that it's possibly a piece of a raw material used for making copper square boat nails. Haven't been able to find a record of a blacksmith actually in the village of Robin Hood's Bay, but if they didn't have one, there certainly was one in nearby Filing Thorpe. And of course, it might not be that old, so some boat owners now will certainly have the tools and capabilities to make nails. It is quite easy to hammer copper into other shapes, and if you have an oxyacetylene torch, then annealing is possible, otherwise homemade nails would be brittle and prone to cracking. That's quite enough about a simple piece of copper, the silver didn't get anywhere near as much fort. On to the brass, which has oxidised brownish since coming out of the stream. I recognised it easily. I've taken apart door handle mechanisms before. It is another first time find though, if you discount almost every domestic door I've ever walked through. I guess I shouldn't count that as finding them, just being aware of their presence. Anyway, nice piece of brass, as will be the pipe once I've melted the lead off it, a brass coat hook, a squashed piece of copper pipe, and some lead pipe round out the finds from the tunnel. For rest here, a single piece of blue and white, some stones I liked including quartz, carnelian, jasper and jet, and a nice little pile of well-worn sea glass were all things I picked up on a beach just north of Whitby when we went for a swim in the morning before driving off homewards. I did stop off on the homewards journey too to check out a potential mudlarking site, met a nice mudlarker there, didn't film an outing, just checking on its viability. It's a fairly long drive away, but I would like to go there again sometime when the days are a little longer and tie it in with visiting a nice town. I do hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, and if you'd like to, then any expression of appreciation that flows my way is greatly appreciated. Pressing the like button or the dislike button, the subscribe button and the bell icon, writing a comment, replying to somebody else's comment, sharing a link to my videos on another platform, or even just copying the share link and not posting it elsewhere, it all helps. A big thank you to all of the kind people who have donated through Ko-fi, Super Chats during premieres, Super Thanks on video pages and purchases from my Amazon wish lists. I am very grateful. I hope you're looking after yourselves and loved ones as best you can. It's a lonely time of year for many, so if you can alleviate that loneliness for somebody, then I hope you do. Finally, thank you all very much for watching, and for now, goodbye.